if you know what the Word of God says and you know where people stand on different issues, then it ought to be pretty clear what we ought to do. Uh, and the subject we're going to look at here this morning is a subject that was a Bible issue long before it ever became a political issue, and that is the topic of abortion. Yeah. And we need to look at what the Word of God says, but I need to lay uh, a background with uh, some different things, and you'll kind of see that as the message goes on. But I want to give you a lot of scriptures at the end and bring these truths home. And then, too, I want to leave you with some things. What do we do with all this? What's our responsibility? Um, you know, what does God expect from us as believers? And then, of course, another goal I have is if you're here this morning and you're not sure, heaven is your home. You might be a good person. You might be very religious. But my goal is to make sure that before you leave this place, you know how to be saved. You know how to have a home in heaven. Uh, because that's, that's God's will for all mankind, but he does not force us to make that decision. Because he loves us, he leaves the decision up to us. So Psalm 139, if you would, we're going to start reading here in verse 13. <clears throat> Psalm 139 and verse 13. And let me say this too. I know I did not preach this message tonight because we'll have younger kids in here. Uh, and some people, because of their upbringing and background, uh, there are certain things maybe they don't talk about. But what we're going to talk about here this morning are just facts of life. Uh, I think it's something as adults we can handle and the teenagers in here can handle as well. These are simply facts of life. I will try not to be uh, crude. I will try to be discreet as much as I can about some of this stuff. But uh, it is things, some of the words and terminology you may not personally use, but I think when, when I use certain words and terminology, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So uh, anyway, just bear with me as I go through uh, this particular message because there's a lot of truth here we need to understand and we need to get ourselves. So Psalm 139, verse 13 says this. It says, For thou hast possessed my reins, as speaking of God Almighty. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. I pray that you will guide and direct our time together now. And, and Lord, I pray as Christians that we will take heed to the things that we hear. But Lord, not only, sometimes we may say, okay, well I know this, and we may tune things out, but we need to realize the seriousness of, uh, that you place, the, the seriousness you place on this particular topic. Amen. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that you help us, uh, not just because uh, we might be your people, but, Lord, we want you to bless our nation. Yes. Uh, we want you to guide and direct in our country. I think as American citizens, we would all say we love our country. But our country is in a mess, and a big part of the reason it's in a mess is because of this particular one thing right here. Uh, there's a lot of other things going on. But, Lord, I pray that you help us now to sort out uh, the truths and help us to see clearly what you have for us here this morning. And, Lord, I do pray if there be someone here or someone listening later that is not sure if heaven is their home, Lord, help me to give a very clear gospel presentation so that they might know Jesus Christ as the only true and living God and the only Savior that we could have. And, Father, we ask and pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we get started, I'm just going to jump right into this. I'm not. I'm going to kind of go away from the Word of God here for just a second, and then we're going to jump back into it. Uh, we need to see, first of all, and understand what the debate is from the left. Uh, you have heard the uh, pro, what they call pro-choice. I call it pro-death because that's what they're for. Uh, the pro-death crowd. They push a theme called "My Body, My Choice." You hear that over and over again. Now, when I give you some of this stuff. Uh, you're going to see that's simply not at all true. Uh, it's not my body, my choice. We'll see it from the Word of God. We'll see it from science itself. And I've simply been titled this message, When Science Catches Up to the Word of God. 
You see, sometimes science has to catch up to the Word of God. But at one time, science taught the world was flat. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that, that we, the earth is a sphere. The Bible teaches a lot of things. There, the Bible teaches, as a matter of fact, there's currents in the ocean before mankind ever figured out there were currents in the ocean. There's a lot of things that God has stated because he created the world. And his truth is right here. So we ought to believe this, whether science follows it or not. Right. I mentioned in the early service that uh, back when we went through COVID-19, there was, you know, Fauci kept saying, follow the science, follow the science. The science says you got to wear a mask. And then for some reason the science said you don't have to wear a mask. And then the science said you had to wear a mask again. The science said you had to be six feet. And then the science said you had to be three feet. And then the science said you had to be six feet. I mean, it kept it. that wasn't science. That was man's opinion. But they call it science. You see, what I'm talking about, though, is real science. Because it comes, it's based on truth. It's based on God's word. So we need to understand the debate from the left. There was a political rally in La Crosse, Wisconsin, here this past week, and uh, Vice President Harris was talking about this particular topic. She was talking about Roe v. Wade being overturned, and then somebody in the crowd piped up, you can hear it very plainly on the video, said, Jesus is Lord. Now, this is a Democratic rally, and they piped up, Jesus is Lord, to which she replied, I think you're at the wrong rally. <laughs> implying Jesus is not Lord at their rallies. Yeah. 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 Now that's pretty serious. I don't think that's what she intended to convey. But as you can see, Satan is the master deceiver. Right. Yeah. And people are being deceived under this very topic. And I would say she's probably one. I don't think that was her intention uh, to say that because I would think there would be Christians in both parties and they ought to feel welcome in both parties but the sad thing is the direction that some things are going politically and the platforms that they stand on do not line up with the Word of God. And as a Christian, we need to make sure we're always lined up with the Word of God, not a political party. So what about this thing about my body, my choice? Let me give you some things here. This is actually from a survey done back in 2013. And it is a survey of why... People normally get white women get abortions. Men cannot get abortions. Okay, I don't care what the wokeism says today. Only women can get abortions because only women can get pregnant. Uh, but this study was done, and there's a few things I want you to notice through this. I've highlighted some things I want you to see here. Um, but in this particular study, not over 93% of abortions are done in the first trimester. That's the first 13 weeks. Oh, I guess that would help. <laughs> now, see, what you all did there was correct. That's what you need to do to this pastor. You need to stop me where I'm at. Because sometimes I get carried away. <laughs> so, there, now we're good. All right. So, here's what I want you to see. Can you all see this little screen right here? <laughs> all right. First of all, remember, 93%. Now, the abortions are done in the first 13 weeks, the first trimester. Now, here are some reasons people give. Now, if you are a math person, you're going to go through like I did, and you're going to think, well, these percents don't add up to 100. They're way over 100. But here's why. Because some people gave three reasons or four reasons why they got this abortion, and what they did is they took the total number of correspondence and the total number of answers that fell in that category, and that's where they came up with the percents. So, the percents are not going to add up, obviously, to be 100. This is the percent of the total people responded who gave this as a particular reason. Now, again, they might have had three or four reasons, and they're included in these other things. But around 40% in the study mentioned a financial reason for needing an abortion. If you look at the timing, more than one-third, 36%, I didn't have a highlight here, uh, cited reasons related to timing. They weren't financially prepared, emotionally prepared. 31% uh, of the study gave reasons relating to their partner. Well, you know, my partner's just not for it. They didn't want me to have this child. Around 8% wanted to get married before having children. Hmm. Maybe they shouldn't have been doing something in the first place called fornicating. Right. You see, there's a good thing uh, that will prevent that. Anyway, 29% of people mentioned that they needed to focus on their other children. 
Probably should have thought about that ahead of time. 19% of the people studied expressed that they were emotionally or mentally unprepared for a child. 12% mentioned the following health-related reasons, concerns for their health, concerns for the health of the fetus. Let me stop right here and say this about the health of the fetus or the health of the baby. It is a fetus for a period of time, but it's still a baby from the time, and you'll see this in just a second as I get into some other things, from the time that child is conceived, it is a baby. Amen. Now, we can call it different terms, uh, scientific terms. It doesn't change the fact it's still a baby. Right. Okay, so I think we understand that. But uh, some people say, well, my, the baby might be born blind, or it's going to be born without an arm, or it's going to be born this or that. The Word of God, and I should have stopped, I went over this verse yesterday, I should have recorded it, uh, but I did not. But the verse in the Bible talks about God is the one who makes the blind, He makes the lame, yeah. He makes yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. And it tells us in the New Testament, the disciples asked Jesus when Jesus was came across the blind man, Here's what the disciples said. They said, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And you know what Jesus said? Neither. Neither. This man or his parents. But that the glory of God might be revealed in him. You see, God makes us a certain way because he is going to get the glory through our lives. So this is not, obviously, a good reason for an abortion. You can go on down here. It's 12%. Uh, chose abortion because of their desire for a better life for the child more than what they could provide for. Should have thought about that ahead of time. Under 7% of people reported a lack of maturity and said they had to rely on other people. 5% of people described influences from family and friends. And you can see all these things here that I mentioned, none of them are good reasons. And here's why. Because my Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord... With all thy heart and lean not on thine own understanding. Right. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Right. Early on, when and Becky and uh, my marriage and relationship, we'll make sure those TVs were off. Uh, five years, in five years, she had six pregnancies. Two miscarriages, four children. And... Now, being the provider, Becky and I both, we felt led of the Lord early on that uh, she was going to be a stay-at-home mom. And so she worked for just a little bit of time a few months after we knew she was pregnant. And then she, she quit. And she was going to be a stay-at-home mom. That's what we felt the Lord leading us to do. And I knew, being in the ministry, preachers don't make a lot of money. Now, that might be news to you, but they don't. <laughs> Even though I drive a Cadillac. Okay? <laughs> That was a gift from my aunt who passed away. But uh, anyway, these don't make a lot of money. Now, I knew that, and I knew I was going to be the main breadwinner of the family. So my wheels were turning in my head. At one point, these kids are probably going to think about going to college. I'm going to encourage them to go to a Christian college. Now, you may not notice about Christian colleges, but they don't qualify for federal loans. You pay out of pocket for these things. I graduated from a Christian college. She graduated from a Christian college. And I knew that we had to work our way through it. It took me seven years to finally get through college. And I had to work, stay out a couple semesters, go back a semester, stay out a semester, go back a semester. And I still had some, some uh, bills to pay off whenever I got done. So it was all out of my own pocket. It was not a handout from the government. It wasn't anything else. You know, those things are there. If you can use them, great. But they're not available in Christian colleges. So I'm starting to think, okay, with four kids, they're probably going to go to college. They're probably all going to be in college at the same time. How is this going to work, Lord? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Right. Now, this did not determine our decision about any other kids coming after that. Now, we did take some, some steps and precautions because her health was at risk. Uh, because of so many pregnant, there were things that she was dealing with. And so we felt that the Lord temporarily to try to limit any possibility of her being able to be pregnant. But once that passed, we left everything back to God again. But we would not even have done this, uh, the limitation part if we didn't feel led to the Lord to do so. It wasn't decisions we were making ourselves in our own head. You see, we don't plan our families. We let God plan our families for us. There's a big difference there. Now, we get into this thing about the debate from the left. You saw all those reasons people gave. Obviously, none of them were trusting the Lord. So what about this thing, my body, my choice? We see the debate from the left. 
Now let's look here at the data from science. When science catches up to the Word of God. When does life begin? Now there are four stages of fetal development. The first stage is called fertilization. This is where the sperm and egg unite and it forms what is come to term a zygote. It's still a baby, but it's when those things get together. This happens in the animal kingdom. It happens in humans. And we are not part of the animal kingdom, by the way. Uh, we are completely separate. Okay. Then number two, the second stage is implantation. This is when the zygote attaches to the uterine wall, forming an embryo. This happens immediately after fertilization. Then you have a third stage called organogenesis. This is when the embryo's organs start to develop. Again, immediately after all this takes place. Step one, step two, step three, boom, like that. Step four, however, is the fetal stage. This is after 10 weeks, the fetus continues to grow, which is the baby. It continues to grow. Now, there's a new scientific discovery found that the moment of fertilization, the moment the sperm and egg get together, there is a light emitted in the womb. Now, zinc, the mineral zinc, is obviously involved in this process because they have termed it, basically, it's like zinc fireworks. And... This has also been called the signature of when life is formed. Now, God is in the tiniest of details. You think about how small we're talking about here. God is in the tiniest. If every hair of our head is numbered, nothing passes God's attention. John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, listen to these verses here. It talks about God. In Him was life, speaking of Jesus Christ. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now that word comprehended actually means to lay hold of as if to make it one's own. The darkness comprehended it not. It doesn't mean it didn't understand it. It means to take hold of. The darkness could not take hold of the light to make it its own because they're two separate things. This applies the same thing to the womb of a mother. That is the darkness. That little speck of light in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and they cannot be the same thing. And again, we'll see that here again in just a second. But only 38% of Americans view fertilization, that unification there, as the starting point of human life. 45% of Americans believe life beginning at conception is only a philosophical or religious belief. It's not rooted in biological or a scientific fact. However, biologists from 1,058 academic institutions were surveyed about this very topic. 96%, I don't know what happened to the other four. They obviously weren't very good in their field. But 96% agree that life begins at fertilization. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. Right. The moment of conception is when life begins. The child in the womb has its own set of chromosomes different from the mother. Women who believe in abortion are quick to bring up that they have rights over their own body. This has the assumption that the unborn is just as much a part of the mother's body as an arm or a leg. However, when tonsils are removed, or an appendix is removed, you don't have any post-tonsillectomy counseling sessions. You don't have any post-appendectomy support groups because they are not needed like you do with post-abortion groups. They are needed. And the reason is, is because deep inside all of us, we know that's a life that was just taken out. A body part, such as an arm or a leg, is defined by the common genetic code it shares with the rest of the body. The unborn child's genetic code is distinctly different from that of the mother's code. Often the blood type is even different than that of the mother's. And what does the Word of God say? The life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You cannot have two different blood types unless you have two distinct lives. The unborn has a separate circulatory system, a separate nervous system, and a separate endocrine system. 
There are times when the child may die and the mother lives, or the mother dies and the child lives, proving they are two distinct bodies. Now, the rest of what I'm going to read you here is actually from an article. This article is called, Is the Unborn Part of the Mother's Body? This is from a group called Eternal Perspective Ministries. Listen to what some of these things they say. The unborn child takes an active role in his own development, controlling the course of the pregnancy in the time of birth. New Zealand professor A.W. Lyle is known as the father of fetology. Among his many pioneer achievements was the first intratorine blood transfusion, Dr. Lyle has stated. Physiologically, we must accept that the conceptus, which is the child, the conceptus is, in a very large measure, in charge of the pregnancy. Biologically, at no stage can we subscribe to the view that the fetus is a mere appendage of the mother. In other words, it's not her body. It's not just part of her body. It is a separate, distinct body. It is the embryo who stops his mother's periods and makes her womb habitable by developing a placenta and a protective capsule of fluid for himself. He regulates his own amniotic fluid volume, and although women speak of their waters breaking or their membranes rupturing, these structures belong to the fetus. fetus. And finally, it is the fetus, not the mother, who decides when labor should be initiated. Dr. Peter Nathaniels of Cornell University concurs. He agrees with this. He says that the unborn's brain sends a message to his own pituitary gland, which is in turn, it stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete a hormone, which stimulates the mother's uterus to contract. A woman goes into labor not because her body is ready to surrender the unborn child, but because the unborn child is ready to leave her body, which goes right along with Scripture. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. It wasn't Mary that sent forth her son. It was when the fullness of time was there. In Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, uh, the first part of verse 7 talks about uh, when they had gone to Bethlehem. It was then that she was to be delivered. Mary didn't determine that. She would have rather had the child at home. But that was when God, who's in control and is in charge of these things, the baby is what says, okay, I think now's the time. We were out to eat with Jared and Aaron, and I don't remember which child it was, but we were there at the Mexican restaurant. And all of a sudden, that baby just determines, I think now's a good time. And she's like, I think something happened. And they went off to the hospital, and there the baby was ready to be delivered. You see, that's how it works. Being inside of something is not the same as being part of something. One's body does not belong to, this is still a continuation of that particular article, one's body does not belong to another's body merely because of proximity. A car is not part of a garage because it is parked there. A loaf of bread is not part of the oven in which it is baked. Luis Brown, the first test tube baby, was conceived when sperm and egg joined in a Petri dish. She was no more a part of her mother's body when placed there than she had been part of the Petri dish where her life began. A child is not part of the body in which she is carried. As a person inside a house is not part of the house, so a person inside another's body, another's body is not part of that person's body. Human beings should not be discriminated against because of their place of residence. A person is a person whether she lives in a mansion or an apartment or on the street. She is a person whether she's trapped in a cave, lying dependently in care in a care center or residing within her mother. We all believe a premature baby lying in a hospital incubator deserves to live. Would the same baby deserve to live any less simply because she was still in her mother? <laughs> Consider this true to life scenario. There are two women who become pregnant on the same day. Six months later, woman A has a premature baby. Small but healthy. Woman B is still pregnant. One week later, both women decide they don't want their babies anymore. So why should woman B, the one who had the abortion, why should woman B be allowed to kill her baby and woman A is not allowed to kill hers? Mm -hmm. You see the problem here? Mm -hmm. Since there is no difference in the nature or development of the two babies, why would woman B's action be exercising a legitimate right to choose while woman A's action, the one who baby was delivered early, would be a heinous crime subjecting her to prosecution for first-degree murder. 
It is irrational to recognize the one child as a baby and pretend the other one is not. Now, we see the problem from the left. We see the data we have from science. Now let's look at what the doctrine of the Word of God is, the teachings of the Word of God. We have right here in Psalm 139, verse 13. It says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. That phrase right there, when I was made in secret, is talking about the fertilization process. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. It says, look, at the point of conception, that's where it all began. You knew about me ahead of time, and that was when you started fashioning me and molding me and making me into what I am now, even though there weren't any of my members. You were in the process of making them. That's the miracle of life. Turn with me if you would. I want to have you turn to just a couple places, and then I'm going to read some other verses to you. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1, and look at verse number 5 if you would. So what is the Word of God teaching us? Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. This is the prophet Jeremiah. If we back up to verse 4 of Jeremiah, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So now God is speaking here. He says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That's pretty important. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. What this verse is teaching us is, one, that God makes us. He's the one who does all the fashioning. And then, two, each person is born with a purpose. You think about all the abortions that have been committed. How many, I'm sure, in one of those abortions, there was going to be a great doctor who had a cure for cancer. Still don't happen today. Why? Because the child was aborted. God has a plan and purpose, but God does not override our free will. You see, he has a reason for why he's doing what he's doing. And that's where we simply need to trust him. Galatians 1.15 says that when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, we all have a plan and purpose. And all of those aborted babies had a plan and purpose. What if Becky and I had decided to abort our kids? We'd have no Elizabeth. We had no Timothy, no Andrew, no Nathaniel, no Abigail. And if we were waiting until things financially lined up, I'm not even sure we would have had Nehemiah. You can't wait and trust in your own thinking. You must depend on God Almighty and leave things up to Him. I can't remember which one of the children it was, but we were told that they could have. Uh, there was a, a possibility they could have some defect. I don't remember what it was that they, they were told. That was a no brainer to us. It's like, we don't care. Whatever. God can fix it. He can take care of it. But there's a plan and a purpose for each and every child. The Bible talks about the fruit of the womb being God's reward. Job chapter 10 verse 8 says, Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about. As Isaiah 44, verse 24 says, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. Um, chapter 49, verse 5 says, The Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. You see, all of us have a plan and purpose. Take, if you would, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Just quickly, Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Now, I know there's people in here from different situations and different backgrounds. And here's the thing I can tell you. I, whether you have 50 kids, no kids, or you're not able to, I know we have all kinds of here. And God knows our situations. God, I don't understand it all. You probably don't understand it all either. But we need to trust God Almighty. I thought about uh, Elizabeth right now. She's not able to have any children. She's, she's having some difficult times. And uh, you know, she's trying to do some things that she can naturally and all that. But you know what? God's in control. 
God is the one who's merciful. God is God can be protecting that child from some horrendous thing that would happen in the future that we don't know about. But yet we could say we could be all selfish about it and say, Oh, you know, glory, that's what happens to us, what happens to us. And then this child's born, and then it goes through something terrible that would actually kill us to see that child going through. But God in his wisdom and his grace, he does all things well. God is good, as the lady was just saying just a moment ago. Luke chapter 1, verse 41. This is when Mary came to her cousin Elizabeth. And, of course, Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist. And Elizabeth now is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Look at verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. That is a life that is in that womb. Look at verse 44. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded into my ears, the babe leaped in my womb. Look at those last two words. For joy. This child can experience joy in the womb. Isn't that amazing? God's word is very plain about life. It begins at conception. So now that we've seen the doctrine from the word of God, let's talk about a very serious part of this. This is the death of innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood is murder of any kind. If somebody was to take one of your loved ones, we've seen this all across our land, uh, we've seen you know, the number one thing in our country, people are saying the number one topic is immigration. Number two is the economy. Some people say number three is this topic of abortion. But you know what? For a Christian, immigration is a serious thing as far as an American citizen. Uh, our economy, I'd much rather our economy doing better. But you know what is more important? Is us obeying the book right here. Right. Is us following what God says in the book. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We want God to fix the rest of the mess. We better start following this book. That becomes a primary importance. So we see the death of innocent blood. Proverbs 6, 17, uh, verse 16 and 17 talk about there are six things that God hates. gave seven are abomination unto him. And guess what one of those things are? Hands that shed innocent blood. There are doctors and nurses that are going to have to stand before God, and they're going to have to give an account for murder after murder after murder after murder. And they can say all they want, say, well, it wasn't my decision, it was this person's decision or that person's decision. Uh, or I might have lost my job. I tell you what, any day of the week, I would much rather lose my job and maintain my integrity with God than I would be actually to perform and commit a murder. God help us. Psalm 106, verse 37 and 38 says, Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. Remember what Vice President Harris said, and again, I'm not slamming her for this. I think she said it in ignorance, not thinking about what she was saying. But what she was saying was very true. The Lord, Jesus Christ, is not present in many of those circles in that party. Sad to say, but true. You know why? Because it doesn't line up with the Word of God. God is not in all their thoughts. It says here, And they shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. You know what's happened, what the problem is in America? Our land is polluted with blood. Lots of blood. Remember what God told Cain whenever Cain had killed his brother Abel? He says, where is your brother? He goes, well, I don't know. My, bro my brother's keeper. And God said, his blood is crying unto me from the ground. One person's blood is crying unto God from the ground. How much innocent blood has been shed in our land? God will not hold us guiltless for this thing. Deuteronomy 21, verse 9 says, So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you. How can we put away the guilt of innocent blood from among us? It says, When thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. I'll tell you a couple ways we can do that. A couple ways we can put away the guilt of innocent blood. First of all, you can exercise your American citizenship right and responsibility by voting. Amen. That would be a good place to start. And the people you vote for are people who stand for capital punishment. That puts away innocent blood. I'm not at all for giving people life sentences to support them for 20 or 30 years in prison when they have killed not just one person, but multiple people. 
Right. And they have confessed to these things. Sometimes they're on, even states where they exercise the capital punishment, they're on death row for yeah. years. Yeah. It doesn't cause, and I'm not trying to say this to be cruel or callous, and God knows my heart, but a bullet does not cost that much. Exactly. Amen. Now, somebody's job has to do it, and I'm going to tell you, because it lines up with the Word of God, I would be more than happy to be the one to pull the trigger. Some of you may not be able to handle that. Now, I would understand the seriousness of what I would be doing. That's not murder. That is God sanctioned throughout the Scriptures. There were many times when the, the prophets of the Lord would take sword in hand and they would slay the wicked before their eyes. Remember uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal? 450 prophets of Baal he had murdered, not murdered, but killed right then and there. Why? Because of their wickedness and what they were doing. And God bless it. We better line up and stand. We are not more compassionate than God. We're not more loving than he is. We better line up where God lines up on things. 2 Kings chapter 21. Take your Bibles, turn there if you would with me. And then I have to turn one more place and then we'll wrap it up here. Exodus, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 21. This is dealing with King Manasseh. Manasseh was a very wicked king. He reigned in uh, Jerusalem there for 55 years. And then at the end of his reign, he turned to the Lord with all his heart. Now, I want to give you some things here we can do about this topic in just a minute, but we ought to pray for our leaders. I don't know. People have said President Trump is he's a born-again Christian. I hope he is. Until I see rock-solid evidence, I'm going to keep praying for his salvation. Vice President Harris, same thing. President Biden, same thing. We ought to pray for the salvation of the leaders in our country. God's concerned about their soul. We ought to be concerned about their soul. We are commanded to pray for our leaders. Second Kings 21, here Manasseh at the end of his reign had a very wicked reign, and he turned to the Lord. But we're going to look at what he did early on in his reign. Listen to what it says here about innocent blood. Look at verse 6. It says, And he made his son to pass through the fire, and observed times, and used enchantments, and dealt with the mere spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Look, if you would, in verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. If God calls it sin, we better call it sin. Yeah. If he calls it good, we better call it good. But God says this shedding of innocent blood, he filled the land with innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood. It's hard for us to sing God bless America when we have not put away the guilt of innocent blood in our land. Look at Exodus 21 as we think about, again, this topic of a woman's body and the life of the child. They are two separate bodies. Again, the Word of God clearly points this out. Exodus 21, look if you would in verse 22. And again, I'm not trying to be political because this is not really a political topic. This is a biblical topic. Right. It was vital long before Roe v. Wade was ever passed. It was always a moral issue because it's in the Word of God. Exodus 21 and verse 22. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Let me go to the next chapter. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge's determined. What he's talking about here in verse 22, it says, look, there's a woman, and she's, she's with a child, and another guy comes up and hurts her, and that child now has to be delivered. And there's no harm, there's no mischief to follow. There's no harm left to her, there's no harm to the child. Then her husband can determine how this guy is going to be punished. That's what that verse, that's what that verse is saying. God said this is, this is what's right. He can determine how he's to be punished. But then listen to this in verse 22. I'm sorry, verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then shalt thou give what? Yeah. Life yeah. for life. It goes on here and it says, 
Then shalt thou give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strike for strike. What that's saying is you have a woman with a child, and she is injured by somebody in such a way that now that child is delivered. If that child's arm ends up being cut off in the process, the guy who caused this, his arm is to be cut off. Right. If that child's life is to be taken, his life is to be taken. Mm-hmm. If the mother's life, uh, maybe she loses a leg or something in the accident because of it, his leg is to be taken off. Life for life, wound for wound, burning for burning, doesn't matter what it is, that's what happens to that guy. But it is life for life, whether it is the mother or whether it is the child. That is what God's Word says. Life is very important. So, knowing all that, as science finally catches up to the Word of God, we see what the Word of God says. We see how God looks at this seriousness of the death of innocent blood. What's the decision we need to make as God's people? First of all, the decision you need to make is you need to make sure heaven's your home. First and foremost, the reason is, is because we're all going to die someday. If the Lord doesn't come back, and I believe He is coming back in our lifetime, but until that happens, we're going to die, and we're going to spend eternity somewhere. Whether it's heaven, whether it's hell, the decision we make for Jesus Christ is going to determine that. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, you need to do that today. Now, I'm glad some, somebody in here may have, you know, they may, maybe made a bad decision somewhere and they had an abortion. I'm going to tell you this. God loves you. He still has a plan and purpose for you. The woman who was in the decision of Roe v. Wade, God tremendously used her life after that decision was made in our Supreme Court. God used her in a great way to fight against abortion. Pretty ironic that her name was on the court case. But I'm here to tell you, God still has a plan of purpose for you. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. And He wants to use you in a mighty way. But He wants you to make sure that you're saved as well. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I'm not asking you if you're religious. I'm not asking you if you've been in church for most of your life. Some people say, well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. Because you had to realize there was a time when you were lost without Christ in order for you to be a Christian in the first place. Right. If you never realize that, then you can't be a Christian right now. You're just deceived by the devil thinking you're a Christian when you're really not a Christian. Right. You need to be what Jesus says and become born again. You need to have that spiritual birth. That's God's will for you. That's His will for me. That's His will for all mankind. But He leaves the decision up to us. Will we accept the free gift of salvation? And then what do we need to do? Once we become God's child, what do we need to do about this particular topic? Well, we better realize God's Word is always true. I don't care if the science lines up or not. God's Word is true from the beginning. It's forever settled in heaven. Eventually, science will catch up. It'll get there eventually. And many I can't tell you the number of times science has discovered something that was already in God's Word. Hmm. happens over and over again. We need to realize God's word is true. We need to also realize life begins when? At conception. The moment of fertilization, that's when life takes place. That's conception. That's when everything begins for life. Now, for God, God knew about all of our lives before conception even happened. He already had it ahead of time. But for us, that's where life begins. We need to also realize we have a responsibility, a huge responsibility, to protect innocent blood. Would you protect your family? I hope you would. I would protect you in here in this church. I would protect my friends. But protecting innocent blood, voices that can't even speak for themselves yet. We have a responsibility. What do we do about it? Well, one thing we ought to pray. Yes. We ought to exercise our citizenship responsibilities by voting. Yes. We ought to do all these. Now, some, some Christians, 41 million evangelicals, it's estimated, 41 million people who call themselves a Christian are not going to vote in this election. Right. Is it any wonder our country's in the shape it's in? Right. 
Amen. It is sad. Sad. Thank God for our country. Thank God for the freedoms we enjoy. But the moment we fail to be willing to fight for those freedoms, to stand up and do what's right, is the moment we don't deserve them. Do we deserve what we're getting in the first place? No. Exercise our responsibility. Protect innocent blood. Vote for people who are for. And you don't even hear capital punishment anymore because people are so afraid to touch that topic because it sounds so harsh and cruel. You're more compassionate than God is. You know why God put capital punishment in the Bible? It was to stop repeat offenders. Amen. It was to stop them from destroying another family by murdering another one and another one and another one and another one. God says, you just take out their life. That'll fix it. Amen. And when people realize there is a deterrent, they start to think twice about it. But when there's no deterrent, they don't care. Right. So we need to pray. I'm going to talk tonight about the topic of fasting. I want to ask you to do some fasting. Fasting is a lost Christian practice. We don't do it nearly enough. But you want to get God's attention? You better learn to fast. Fasting goes with prayer. Fasting goes with the reading of God's Word. It's important for us to fast. We have a lot of things to pray about. Not just for this upcoming election, but for our nation. We have a divided country in so many aspects. But you know what? There's people on the other side. I can't handle, I can't handle stupidity very well. That's people who are dumb on purpose. That's not people who just don't know. There are people who are dumb on purpose. You can't help them. But there are people. I can still pray for them because God can open their eyes and open their understanding. But the people that we can help are sometimes just the people who just don't know. They've never heard. It's like the missionary we had uh, from Cambodia. He was here. He talked about the name of Jesus Christ. He said in his country, there are millions that have never, ever heard Jesus. Never, ever heard of the name. Never even heard of Jesus Christ. Don't have any idea who he is. In our country, we use his name as a cuss word. Yeah, yes. May God help us. Yes, amen. What are we going to do as a Christian? Where are we going to stand on this particular topic, let alone other topics? Are we going to stand where God stands? One day we're going to have to stand somewhere, and that's at the feet of Jesus. And then we're going to bow. We're going to kneel before him. And we're going to have to give an account of every thought, every deed, every idle word that we've said, done, whatever. What are we going to do when it gets to this topic? God help us. I want God to bless America. I hope you love our country. I hope you not just love our country, but I hope you love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've said this many times. I am a Christian before I'm an American citizen. Before I'm an American citizen. If our country goes astray, that's not going to change where I'm going. I'm still going to heaven. We better make sure that we are fulfilling the things that God has given us to do. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that, Lord, you make us all. You create us with a special purpose in our life. And, Lord, I pray. I pray, Lord, you help us when it comes to this serious, serious topic of innocent blood. That's being shed across our land. Lord, I pray for these doctors and nurses that are performing this because, Lord, I am quite sure they are not saved. I don't know how they could be. Lord, I pray for our leaders who stand uh, in support of this particular issue. And Lord, they're on the wrong side of the Word of God. Lord, I pray for their salvation. Lord, I pray you help us as a nation to fulfill our responsibility to you. There are some Christians in our country, and this is the sad state, and Lord, you know this. They would rather belong to a political party than to be identified with Jesus Christ. And they claim the name of Jesus at the same time. And that just doesn't line up. God, I pray you help us. Because I don't care what party we belong to, we're not going to be have to, we're not going to have to answer for that before you. What we are going to have to answer for is what have we done 
with what we've heard. So Lord, help us. Help us to be more serious about this topic. Help us to pray more fervently the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Help us, Lord, not to trust in our own decisions, but to lean upon your everlasting arms and to acknowledge you in all of our ways and not what we think. So, Father, we ask and pray these things and ask you to bless the song of invitation time. And, Lord, if there is one here in our service that is not sure of heaven is your home, that, Lord, they would come.